I'm Ione Butler. I'm the founder of Uplifting Content. And today I am so excited. I, I said I'm starstruck. I don't quite believe that you believe me. Um, to, um, to have as a guest today, the wonderful Chris Voss. Chris, thank you so much for joining us today. <laughs> my, it's uh, my pleasure. Absolutely my pleasure. Thank you. My pleasure too. Um, please could you, I like to ha have people sort of say in their own words what it is that they do and introduce themselves. So if you could do that before I start to fangirl over the book. I help people be absolute rock stars at negotiation and be happy and have more and have a ball. Um, uh, I was the FBI's lead international kidnapping negotiator. But what I really did was I coached negotiations all over the world. The, the way we did kidnappings, we coached people so the bad guys didn't know we were there. Mm. And it was a tremendous advantage to that. So I'm pretty good at negotiation coaching. Yes, yes, I'm pretty sure you are. So just to give everyone a heads up, I um, read Chris's book that he's got in the background there and never split the difference. I didn't actually read, I listened to the audio book. Living in LA, I do a lot of listening to stuff in the car because it's like a little uh, university. And I loved it, a friend had recommended it. Um, listen to the whole thing. It was one of the audio books that I would get out of the car and carry on listening on my phone and then come home and be cooking in the kitchen with it playing. It was one of the ones I couldn't stop listening to. And then um, I finished it a couple of weeks ago and then started it immediately again <laughs> to listen to it again. So I just, I'm, that's why I'm super pumped about talking to you um, because I just want to kind of have people just understand how powerful it is just to have techniques to, the title of this is to get what you want without being a jerk. And what I love about the book is it's not about manipulating people. It's about getting all the information that you can um, create in a relationship with somebody so that they can trust so that you can have a dialogue and then using techniques to kind of to, to get things on your terms. So that's what I really loved about it. Um, so many questions where to start. Um, first of all, in the book, you talked a little bit about how you, how you got into it, um, you know, volunteering at the, the, the suicide prevention helpline and that type of stuff. But, but what is it? Like, why did, you, why did you want to get into it? Were you always a master negotiator? Like, <laughs> what, what was that, that pull? No, no. Um, it, I mainly wanted to get into it because I wanted to stay in and around crisis response. I'd, I'd been on uh, the SWAT team. And, you know, like, so to me, every bad thing that's happened in my life uh, has led to something great, fantastic. So I, I had no idea how much more I was going to like being a negotiator than I ever liked about being in SWAT. I, I had a knee injury and the knee injury caused me to look elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And, th you know, thank God, hurting my knee was one of the best things that ever happened to me because negotiation was so much more incredible. And I've negotiated more sieges and cases than any SWAT guy has ever been in actual and operated in a siege. You know, like the SWAT guys, they lay, they lay, they lay around in the dark while the negotiators talk. <laughs> and, you know, we talk people out and the SWAT guys, you know, receive them when we, when they come out. So I get to do my thing more and, and then it was more satisfying and more interesting. And plus, you know, I'm still doing it. I'm, I'm having fun doing it in crazy other ways now, like in business and, helping people and everything they do. So you have the, the Black Swan Group, which is your company that is teaching. Is, is it more corporations or, and you also, you're at universities, right? That's teaching people these techniques in negotiation. Well, and we're doing more and more on, in, on an individual level. Now we're bringing out a lot of training to help people get better as individuals. But, you know, I, I got a team. I got, I got a great team. I mean, mm. the, the, the old saying, you want to go fast, go alone. You want to go far, go with the team. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I got great people around me. And interestingly enough, uh, the best coach uh, on our team is my son, Brandon, the director of operations. And if you'd been dealing with a hostage negotiator since you were two years old, you'd be pretty good at it, too. <laughs> yes. That's awesome. You mentioned him in the book. Um, so could you then get tell us um, some of the techniques that you, you teach in the art of how to get what you want without being a jerk? Well, you know, one of, the, one of the ways really is, and the book starts right off with it, like how to elegantly say no. Like, you know, you, uh, you have to say no. You have to be able to say no, not, not to the person, not to the situation, but to different deal points, if you will, or to things that won't work. A lot of times you can make, you can have a better deal by saying no to the things that won't work. So, and so for two reasons, you got to be able to say no to get to a good solution. And then the other thing is there are, there's a percentage of people out there 
probably about 25%. You know, they're going to hammer you till you've said no to them multiple times. So, and, and it's, it's, it's that stupid. Like they have to hear no twice before they'll make a deal. So if you got to hear, if my criteria to get the deal is I got to say no to you nicely twice, then I'll just say it sooner and we'll get, we'll, we'll get the right. deal sooner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, then, yeah, you know, how to say no without offending the other side. How to, how to say no without being a jerk. You know, don't pound the table. Don't call names. Like uh, somebody's asked me, what's the biggest difference between hostage negotiation and business negotiation? Hostage negotiation was more civil. <laughs> wow. Wow. You know, I have heard of people in business deals screaming at each other, calling each other names, pounding on the table, storming out of rooms. Like, we, that never happened in hostage negotiations, mm. ever. Like, you'd be shocked when you really listen and listen to understand, not to agree, but to understand how quickly people calm down and actually start talking. Mm. And, and then the other thing that, that a lot of people don't realize is hostage negotiators have repeat customers. Really? Yeah. So we don't lie. You know, we don't mislead because the hostage taker that I talk out, somebody else is going to see him again. They're, they're going to go to jail. They're going to get back out on the street. There was, there was a siege in Baltimore once where a guy who was wanted for some really bad things, the negotiators were a little rattled when they first got him on the phone. And he said, hey, you know, you're not doing a good job with me. You're supposed to be establishing rapport. <laughs> The hostage negotiator said that to him. The bad guy said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah, sorry, sorry, man. Yeah. Wow. And and what had happened was he'd been in a siege before, and they talked him out. Mm. And if they'd have lied to him or misled him, then the next person that saw him, you know, it would have gone bad. So, you know, believe it or not, I come from a tradition of a long-term relationship and a good good reputation is important. Mm. I wonder, because you, you mentioned in the book, there's a story of uh, a woman who she was working with a guy who was a bit of a misogynist and, um, and he kind of called her out of the blue to discuss stuff and she couldn't like hold her anger back and, and that one didn't go too well. And I feel like th I find that very hard, especially when I'm getting passionate and heated about something in that moment to like calm down and, and come at it from, from a from not that aggressive, angry place, banging your fists on the table. Like, do you have any advice on that? Well, yeah, there's, there's a couple things uh, because I get mad sometimes myself too. And as soon as I get mad, then I'm, then it ruins my ability to negotiate and mm. I get mad. Mm. Um, and I was thinking about being in a negotiation with somebody I really didn't like because this person, I just can't trust them. Now there's no, there's no problem with doing a deal with somebody you can't trust. Just don't kid yourself about the fact that you can't trust them and just proceed, you know, eyes wide open. Mm. But I was, as I was going through it, I was, I was, I couldn't think of the right things to say. And I remember saying to myself, look, actually, the only reason I'm in this negotiation is because I'm doing well. So I'm actually lucky to be talking to this person at all. And instantly my, my mood changed. Now there's some, there's some psychological data, some really strong information that says that our brain works up to 31% better in a positive frame of mind. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so, you, you know, you being positive is just not, you know, because you're happy go lucky, you're actually smarter. Mm -hmm. And that was what instantly happened with me in that instance. I thought, you know, I'm lucky to be in this conversation. And so that helps me a lot. Um, the other thing too, is like genuine curiosity. If I really am really interested and curious, almost as if the conversation is an adventure because that puts you in a good frame of mind. It's very close to the mental state of flow actually. Mm. And your brain is more accurate. So if I can get out of being offended by your insanity mm. and just be actually curious about it, it's also an instant hack to not getting upset in a negotiation. That's, that's really great advice. Taking, taking the personal thing out of it and just, and just trying to make that your intention, just understanding. And yeah, and you don't have to agree, but understanding where that person's coming from. Right. I, I, do, I do do that sometimes and it, and it does take it, it off me. Um, in, you must be a master in relationships. How does that happen? <laughs> I know. Yeah, come on. I mean, you're saying that your son has known you his whole life. And so he kind of probably knows, knows what's going on. But, but yeah, like, 
what, what's that like? Can you just get, is it, can you pretty much get whatever you want? I mean, you can talk down big hostage, uh, hostage takers. Well, it, it depends upon two things. And the biggest thing is where you're coming from. Mm. I mean, um, Adam Grant's a brilliant, a brilliant author. He's written several books, uh, originals, give and take genius. And he wrote an article once called the dark side of emotional intelligence. I mean, if you get good at this, th this particular, this is what sociopaths are best at. Um, right. Daniel Goleman identified, he identified three kinds of empathy. He said one of them is cognitive empathy, which is just completely understanding your, your emotional wiring. He says that's what sociopaths are absolutely best at. Mm. Sociopaths are good at identifying emotions. They might not feel them all. You don't have to feel them to identify them. So you, you can use your powers. If you're really good at this, you can, you can use, use your powers for evil and not good. I mean, empathy is a powerful, powerful thing mm. if you wrap your mind around it. And it could also be, you know, it keeps people from killing themselves. It's what we use on a hotline. I, I could talk somebody off a ledge in 20 minutes with empathy. Mm. So, yeah, it's powerful stuff, and you can get good at it. Mm. I, I used to – did you ever hear of the book um... – uh, the game. It's about like pickup artists. Did you, uh, did you ever hear that or know of it? I, 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 I have not. I'm, I, <laughs> might go, I might go out and get it. <laughs> <laughs> not assuming that you need it or this would be something that you would have read because it's, it's, it's quite manipulative. And that's why it, it's a, it was like a, it's a story of a guy about how to pick up women basically. And it became this whole thing in sort of Cal in, in San Francisco and in LA and in London and all the major cities, guys would go out and they probably still do and like teach all these techniques to sort of manipulate women. And um, it's genius. It's basically what you're saying. You, you can, you can understand how people's minds works and how that, but the, the way from kind of looking at how they would go about it, it, it just seemed kind of really nasty and seedy to me. Um, like not the best use of those techniques. Well, and then that, that goes exactly to like, what's your motivation? Um, yeah. You know, these are powerful tools. What are you using them for? Mm. If, if my motivation is because I want a long-term great relationship with you. Mm -hmm. You know, there was a famous Goldman, exact, uh, Goldman Sachs executive, Gus Levy, who used to say, greedy, yes, but long-term greedy. Mm. I mean, if I really am a mercenary, if I am a complete sociopath, in my business dealings, I realize that we need to be partners for a very long time because there's a tremendous amount of prosperity that comes from long-term partnerships. Mm -hmm. So what am I really after? If I'm after a long-term relationship where we both prosper, mm. you know, if, if I'm trying, if the, the game, the pick us, pick up artists, you know, the, these are discarding people along the way, having mm -hmm. no intention for a long-term relationship. I, you know, I want to use you in a moment and move on. Mm. The problem with that is it catches up with you. Mm -hmm. Even, even if you, even if you, even if you like that, I mean, you have to eventually leave because mm. your reputation precedes you. You know, people, they proceed you really fast. Do, do the, the old saying, do one thing right, three people know about it, do something wrong, 12 people know about it. Mm. So if you're, if you're, if you're short-term objective only, you better be prepared to move to another city because yeah. before long, people are going to know and they're not going to be interested anymore. It's a very good point. It's very easy to burn bridges quickly. Um, so... So here's a question. I met a guy in a supermarket in Denver a couple of weeks ago and I said, oh, how are you? He said, oh, Was yeah. he carrying a copy of the game? Did, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I told him to get Never Split the Difference. <laughs> he, was this, he was this young kid and I said, how's it going? He was like, oh, it's all right. I was like, why are you all right? And he was like, well, I'm here late. I'm supposed to be at college. Like this is kind of a job I need to get to get through college or school or something like that. But they keep giving me all these late shifts. And um, I told them that I can't because I, I'm, I'm late for college, the school the next day. And they keep giving me all these late shifts and stuff. And I was like, you need to get never split the difference. He said, I basically need to have a conversation with them. And I was like, yes, you do. But before you do, <laughs> thank you. Take out never split the difference. My pleasure. I'm telling everyone about it. So, so just to kind of give people an idea of how you work, what, what if for that kid that goes and has a sit down with his, his colleagues about, um, you know, his, his schedule that they're ignoring him. He's been asking them over and over again to give him times that fit his, his, his schedule and things that he can do. Uh, what, how would you advise somebody to take that conversation? All right. So I'm going to give you a, say, a saying and then we'll flip it and look on the other side. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, one, one of my students in, at, uh, at Georgetown once said that his father told him, Never be mean to someone who could hurt you by doing nothing. Interesting. So, which is great advice. And if you think about it, then you realize that anybody you talk to, that covers everybody. 
-hmm. Like who, if you're talking to them, if they simply choose not to cooperate, they could hurt you. If that's true, then the flip side is true. Everybody that you talk to could help you if they felt like it. Mm. So mm. now what oh. makes them feel like it? Yeah. Well, it's a combination of two things. It's, it's, it's being likable, you know, and there's a difference between being likable and needing to be liked, um, which I think you probably nail that because you are enormously likable, but I don't think you're, you make yourself emotionally vulnerable to needing to be liked because it does make you very vulnerable and, and, it, and it makes people um, easily exploit you. So fine line there. But then, then when the purpose to establish empathy is to get empathy in, re in return. So it's, I want Stephen Covey's advice, seek first to understand, then be understood. Right. Let's look at Covey, the, the mercenary, not because he was a nice guy, because if I want to be understood, then I need to understand you first. It actually saves time. So you would and, say that kid would go in and, and, and then try and understand where the, the, the management is coming from, not giving him his shifts, right. the, the things that he's asking for. So he would come in and ask questions about that. And then say, all right, look, um, you guys are under a lot of pressure and you're giving me shifts because I'm reliable. You know that you're giving me shifts because I show up, you know, um, and you're having trouble finding people that show up. And, and so demonstrate the understanding. And, and then there's, there's one final move. If, if, if they don't throw something on the table at that point in time, which the percentage of time is about 75% of the time that they're just going to go ahead and solve the problem for you. And which like, if you had a gambling system that works 75% of the time, you take it to Vegas and pretty soon Steve wouldn't be working for you. <laughs> but, but then at that, at that point, once you've laid it all out, then you say to the other side, so how am I supposed to get my education if I can't get to class? <clears throat> right. And then, and then that, that's also an empathy inducing statement, a how question. If they're going to help you, um, again, my son, he referred, Brandon says, this is forced empathy. A good how question, I'm going to make you look at my situation and see the dilemma that I'm in. Now, if you don't help me there, then I now know that you're never going to help me. Right. Which now makes me smarter. Mm -hmm. Is it is a long-term relationship mm -hmm. here? Do I stick around or do I start looking for another job? Mm. And if, if I'm working with the right people, then they're going to help me solve that problem. It's like, and it's any bad relationship you're in, mm. you know, get out of that relationship instead of continuing to try to make it better. And I, and I'll, and I'll do a side note for women in negotiation because there, there are a lot of companies out there that have a reputation for paying women less than they pay men. And so, and I, all right, so I'm your dad and you say, how do I get them to pay me more? And I would say, that'd be like asking me, how do you get your boyfriend who abuses you to treat you better? Get out of the relationship. Mm -hmm. If you're working for a company that pays women less than men, the other, not, they're a bad company. Not only is it a bad relationship, but they're going to go out of business because that's stupid, especially in today's day and age. It's one of the reasons why the Fortune 500 is going to turn over by almost 50% over the next 10 years because there's a lot of bad strategy out there. Mm -hmm. So you need to quit that company before they go out of business because it's dumb to pay people less based on their gender. That's just dumb. I have this question for you though. Um, I have found, and I, I found it in myself and I've, I've seen it in other women that, if, so I think it sucks that women don't get paid as much as men. However, if, if somebody's gonna come in and offer themselves as a, as a lesser price, and if somebody isn't going to negotiate themselves, if, if, say, if, if, if women don't negotiate as much or as hard as men to get their salary up, why would a company go, okay, if you're, if you're offering this, I'll, I'll, I'm going to pay you that much more. Do you know what I mean? So I don't know that it's always like a malicious company, but, if, but, but my thing is, it's like, is it, is it that the companies are bad for not offering or is it that women need to up, them, up their value and up what they're coming in with? Uh, so, th yeah, there's two parts to that. They, there's a difference between are they dumb or are they malicious? Mm. All right, so uh, 
there are a lot of them out there that are just dumb. They're mm -hmm. like, I didn't know I should pay you more. You didn't ask. Mm -hmm. That's still dumb mm -hmm. because you're not paying attention to your employees. You're not developing, you're not nurturing them. You're not committed to them. Um, and I, I got, I got no financial interest in Intuit. I recently spoke to Intuit, the QuickBooks people, the Quicken people. And at the conference I was at, they were all about how do you develop your career? How do you get better? How do you get better? How do we help you evolve? How do you help you de develop? And they had several of their male managers up there saying about how they took steps down to move up another ladder. I mean, I, they were just uh, talking nonstop the conference was how do you be a how do i help you develop your career our company will prosper if we develop you as human beings now that's smart mm. now it's, it's it's entirely possible that you're not working for a company that's not malicious they're just dumb mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so um interesting cat that i met here in town sorry for my vernacular it's from all sorts of eras and decades and i love your accent yeah it's fascinating <laughs> <laughs> so um friend of mine, I think the world of Ned Coletti, former, former manager of the Los Angeles Dodgers, took the Dodgers from worst to first in his first season there. I get Ned to come in to talk to my class about negotiation. He says, and I just met him. And he was gracious enough to come in. We just met. He says, what do you want me to say? What do you teach? I said, I don't care what you say. Whatever you say, it's going to be interesting because you're good at what you do. And he was a good guy. So a couple of um, talks about negotiating Barry Bonds deals, all sorts of great deals. Somebody says, Ned, you must get paid a lot. How do you negotiate for yourself? And he says, you know, I, I never really negotiated that hard for myself. I always relied on my employer to pay me what I was worth. And I went, stop, 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 stop. <laughs> because that's exactly what women are accused of doing. And clearly that's not exactly what you do. So what are you doing? What Ned is real good at is not demanding money, but walking away if he doesn't get paid. Yes. And he got, when he got offered the Dodgers job by Frank McCourt, the then offer uh, owner of the Dodgers, in the, in the last moment, McCourt is doing every single trick in a book to try to get an advantage on, on Ned. And he literally offers him to the, the, make the job offer to him like 10 minutes before the clock was going to run out. Because by Major League Baseball rules, you have to make it by a certain time, players and, and managers. And he made the offer and Ned looked at him and started to pack up his briefcase and put his papers in his briefcase and got ready to leave. And Frank McCourt's sitting there just watching him and, and Ned packs his briefcase and head for the door. And McCourt says, what are you doing? He said, I'm leaving. I'm, I'm not working for you for that. Mm. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not working for you for that. In fact, what about a counter offer? What? No, 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 no. I'm, he says, I know what the numbers are. I know what you're paying. I know you're paying this guy too much. I'm not asking for that much, but I'm not working. And this wasn't the first job that Ned offered to walk away from. His first job in baseball, same thing. He was in a desperate situation. So it's not a matter of whether or not he had a good place to go. He just really good at gently saying no. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the element that a lot of people, if men and women, it happens to be women are getting tagged with it these days. I don't think they're the only ones that struggle with that, but the ability to say no nicely, which is what I talked about before, it's a hard thing to do, but that's the real key to negotiation of how can I say no? Cause without calling names, like, cause Ned didn't scream at Frank McCord said, you cheap so-and-so, you know, you Yara, didn't yell, didn't holler, didn't do anything. Just, quietly stood up, started to walk away. And when he stopped him, he said, what are you doing? He said, I'm leaving. Mm -hmm. So the ability to say no gently, I think is a, is a key, is a key term, mm -hmm. key, key talent. But here's the thing though, if somebody, if somebody undervalues themselves anyway, if somebody's going in, if, and, and, and it's happening, like it's difficult because in the acting industry, for example, you've all got agents that are negotiating everybody's different rates, right? So if, if, if somebody's going in and they're like, that's my rate based on my previous stuff and I'm going to have that. And then they, and then, and then somebody else goes in and like, that's my rate. Cause that's what I've done. And the person that has this rate's okay with it. Like then that's kind of a different situation for the, for, for Ned, who you were talking about, who knows, who knows his value. I'm just, but, so, so we're, it's just like, how do you negotiate if you don't, if you don't know what, what the overall 
what what you are what 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 the options are and i think that's why your book is so fantastic because it's like rather than going in with low rates you you find you do your research you find out you know you talked about the guy who graduated from uh with from a law law thing and he kind of went in with a low ball offer and then realized that they start people up on a much higher offer but he'd gone in right. demanding a thing and so right. i guess it's then for for anyone in anyone do your research i guess and find out what the ballpark is and then you also say to offer ranges rather than say this is you know this is what i'm kind of would like you, you offer a range with with the lower offer being your your the, the was it the higher offer being your minimum you kind of give a i forget now well if, if you throw a range out whichever end of it favors the other side that's what they're going with yeah, they're going to go with the lower one. Yeah. So, you know, whatever it is, like I, one student in, in my class at uh, USC on an internship, he knew that the, the range, the rates were from 18 to $24 an hour. He wanted 21, 21. He thought, I'll give him a range and they'll meet me in the middle. And they said, okay, well, I know the market is 18 to $24 an hour. And they said, okay, you get 18. <laughs> right. So you should have said 21 to 24. Or yeah, yeah. You want yeah. 21, say 21 to 24. Then they feel good. Then they feel, they feel like they compromised. Mm -hmm. Do some research, but not too much. Mm -hmm. Because whenever you're competing and they're trying to commoditize you, and you talked about actors being commoditized. All right, so there's, there's never, it's never a pure commodity. There's always, in every negotiation, every, in every, where there's multiple players, there's a favorite and a fool. Now, if you're the fool, and you offer a lower rate, then you were fooled for doing that. Mm -hmm. Because the odds were against you. If you're the favor, if you're the favorite and you offer a lower rate, first you gotta test a little bit. You know, they if you're the favorite, they might give you your rate if you can if if you say whatever your rate is and they say that's high, and and then you look at them and say, Look, but but how am I, how am I supposed to work for less? Mm. They're gonna give you one or two answers. They're going to say, because if you want the job, you'll take it. Mm. At that point in time, you know, you have a deal. Or they'll say, well, you know, and they'll, and they'll soften up a little bit. That how am I supposed to accept that is actually the great probe of the other side's position as to whether or not there's any let. If you've got them, that's the only question you can ask if they're at their limit without driving them away from the table. Mm. If they have any latitude, they'll give it to you. If they don't, they'll look at you and say, because if you want it, you'll take it. Mm, mm. Which means you're still in the negotiation and you probe them as fully as you can. Now you're more fully informed. Whether you take it or not, it's still your option. Mm. They're still giving you the option. Mm. When they say, because if you want it, you'll take it, that means the deal is still on the table. And that's why that's one of the great ways to gently say no and force empathy into the situation and find out whether or not there's any latitude to negotiate. Got it. I like that. Um, could you tell us a little bit about your, the, the courses that you have? Cause I'm interested in taking them. <laughs> and so we'd just love you to share a bit about what you have going on. Uh, if you've got any like live person events, in-person events or the online stuff, it sounds like you're, you're starting to do. Well, we've, uh, we got a newsletter that comes out once a week. That's free. And it's got great succinct stuff in it that comes out every week. It's called The Edge. You can find it on our website, blackswanltd.com. You can, there's a text to sign up feature that I can tell you about later if you want me to or whenever. I can really. put the description in the comments as well for you. So yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's a, that's a free way to start out. Um, uh, we actually were re developing some really robust training with a company that's gonna go online probably in about two months. Mm. Um, but in the meantime, you know, The Edge has got a lot of stuff in it. The newsletter mm. has got a lot of, uh, it's got, there's a whole catalog of specific articles on the website that you can go back through and look for stuff that fit to your specific situation. And you can subscribe to it. Mm -hmm. We've got, we've got a one day training sessions. We're getting ready to do one in New York City, um, October 23rd, I think. We'll be back here in Los Angeles in the spring. So we've got open enrollment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm in LA. Yeah, I love LA. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. For some reason, your accent just did not make me think you were here. So, I mean, mine doesn't either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, who's pointing fingers here, right? 
<laughs> that's hilarious um okay cool so you had the the in-person events as well right right and then then and we've got we've got some stuff on youtube uh you know if you go to our website we've got a lot of resources that supplement the book mm -hmm. that are free and then we've got you know, we're gonna we're gonna come out with some more stuff if you need coaching uh we're not cheap so but if, if you got anything we get we get results so yeah. again my, our best coach my son brandon was coaching a guy in a job negotiation they jumped in they promoted him two levels wow wow so Such yeah we, we, and people look if you're a hard working decent human being then you deserve everything that you can get mm. because you know the old as long as you over deliver then it's really hard for somebody to overpay you because you keep over delivering. Yeah. And it does, you know, it doesn't take that much to over deliver. A lot of it is just showing up and doing a good job because so many people don't that showing up and doing a good job makes you in the top 10% to begin with. Mm -hmm. And so then you should get paid more. Yeah. And, and what's it, the, school, the college that you teach at here? And what, what's part of that program? Is it like- a I, Well, I, I was at the, in the Marshall School of Business at USC in the MBA program, and mm. uh, I'm, not, I'm not doing it anymore. They were great. USC is phenomenal. Mm. What, mm. what a great place to teach. I'm just, I'm just not doing it. I'm not doing it anymore. You full-time on, on your own stuff. We're, yeah, we're, we're bringing this stuff out and getting it out to as many people as we can, yeah. One thing that I, a question that I had while I was listening to the audiobook on repeat is, um, did any hostage taker ever like get hold of these techniques or have you, now you're putting it out there. Is there like, what, how does that work when they, when they get it or somebody gets it and you're kind of up against somebody that's doing the same thing? How does that work? No, they, um, uh, they, they are, they're bullies, mm. you know, and, and they're good at bullying. They're actually, and they have no, and they, and they get 90% of what they want because people don't know how to deal with a bully. I, the, the crazy thing is that the, the procurement negotiator in most companies is, is exactly the same cat as the international kidnapper. <laughs> and, you know, they, they, they get used to getting what they want by intimidating people. And, mm. and so, and they're, and because of that, they're enormously vulnerable to this approach. I mean, they are. <laughs> You know, the tactical application of empathy on, on, on them is just ridiculously effective. So, and yeah, they, they don't, they don't study as much as they should. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good to know. Fantastic. Chris, thank you. I, yeah, to anybody, please check out Never Split the Difference. It, it's right there in the background. We'll put a link to, uh, to the Black Swan Group website. And so you said it's the edge that has all the, the thing, the newsletters that you subscribe to with, Yes. Advice and information. Yeah. It's one of my most enjoyable books I've read this year, listened to, and so I highly recommend it. So thank you for talking to us today. My pleasure. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. I'll be back uh, tomorrow. We've got a bunch of uh, fantastic live streams coming to you this week. So thanks for tuning in, and I will see you soon. Bye. <laughs>